moral philosophers like to urge us to expand or cultivate our moral imagination to better understand others, if only we could just step outside ourselves for a moment and give some thought to what the other person is actually going through, we would perceive their situation more accurately and recognize the morally right response. While I agree, imagination plays a significant and indeed underappreciated role in moral perception, knowledge, and conduct. The call for a more robust imagination can appear quite misleading. It may seem as if the problem lies in an inert, narrow, or underdeveloped imagination. This paper aims to show that this way of thinking about our failure in moral imagination is misguided. I argue that discussions of moral imagination and empathy too often neglect the role of social imagination in shaping an individual's imagination. In order to properly heed the call to expand our moral imagination, we must begin by first asking, what does it mean to expand or cultivate our moral imagination? In order to address this question, we must raise a further question: How does imagination figure in our perception of another person? In particular, if our imagination of someone else's life is limited by our own personal experience. How do we account for the amazingly vast and rich imaginary content that too often occupies our minds? Exploring this question will enable us to better understand how our imagination is being deficient, and also explore an important issue implicit in the demand for an expanded moral imagination: that of agency over how and what we imagine. In order to improve ourselves, we must first understand the extent to which. We get to control the exercise of our imagination. Once we start to unpack how imagination works in interpersonal encounters, it will become clear that the moral demand is not simply one of using imagination where we habitually fail to do so, but more of correcting it along with the misconceptions or misperceptions and misunderstandings it breeds. More importantly. We will also realize that such an ameliorative project cannot succeed or even get off the ground without collective efforts to alter the social imagination. When one is criticized for failing to imagine the other person's reality, the thought seems to be that this person is only taking what she sees at face value and failing to use her imagination. To understand or to explore how the reality may be other than what appears to her, but I doubt that's true. And I suspect most times, when that happens, our imagination is actually rather well developed, actively engaged, and diligently at work. And so here are some examples. So in Ralph Ellison's book *Invisible Man*, the narrator says this. He says. I'm actually right, a person made of substance, flesh, and so on, and yet I am invisible to other people. And when they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Here's a real-life example given in an essay written by philosopher and also writer Chloe Cooper Jones. She was born with a rare congenital disorder that makes her shorter than other women, and she has a curved spine. And her lower body, especially her legs from her knees down and her feet, are underdeveloped and disproportional to her whole body. So, as she says, my body is visually marked by difference. But because of that physical difference, other people have attributed to her all kinds of differences. For example, she was just not seen as. Sexy or sexual or interested in romance, you might say, right? These other kids or other people, they just can't imagine her being sexual. But at the same time, that has a lot to do with how they are actually imagining her. How can we make sense of the claim that the perceiver A does not see the actual person B, but rather what A imagines B to be? To illustrate the role of imagination in our perception of a person, I begin by presenting a recent account of imagination-based perception. In her article, Jennifer Church suggests that we don't receive a whole lot of perceptual information when it comes to figuring out what someone is doing or feeling, and she outlines three distinct ways in which imagining contributes to our perception.
First, imagination can be activated in the form of memory. Say, A perceives a facial expression in B, which prompts some memories of something similar A has experienced or observed in the past, and those memories can allow A to perceive B as, for example, feeling worried or waiting for someone. Second, imagination can also help filling in gaps in what we're seeing. From our past experiences, we can form associations between events that happen often happen one after the other. So, if we see a certain posture or movement or facial expression, imagination can then fill in the associated emotion or intention or action. Some of these associations may even be hardwired into us through evolutionary processes. And then there's the phenomenon called cognitive penetration, as Church writes, thinking of something as a particular sort of thing. That is conceptualizing it in a particular way changes the very look of the thing. So she gives the example of thinking of the concept of anger. So if I bring this concept of anger to my perception, that can cause me to imagine angry faces and so on. And those imaginings can alter the way this particular face in front of me appears. And lastly, imagination can also fill in what might happen next. By projecting those past associations into the future, I think Church's account provides a useful starting point for understanding how imagination figures in our perception of someone, but it's quite limited in scope. For one thing, our perception of a person far exceeds that of what I would call local states, such as emotions or actions, to include global states, such as the kind of person one is and the kind of life they live. And second. Each of the three sources of imagination seems quite personal. For example,、um, my memory depends on what I have experienced. The associations I make and the concepts I draw on again depend on the patterns of thinking and acting I have developed, and the projections I make depend on my observations in similar situations in the past and other personal characteristics. But that is far from the whole story. It is my contention that our imagining is often heavily constrained and not just influenced by the social imagination, and this is especially true when the other appears quite different from ourselves. So the term social imagination、um, is used neither strictly literally nor strictly metaphorically, like some other commentators who have invoked this no this notion. I make no metaphysical commitments. About an unconscious mind or a force or some other such entity underlying each individual's mental activities, and I do not posit faculties of that mind such as imagination. On the other hand,、um, there does seem to be something amiss、um, in referring to those images, ideas, associations, and metaphors and stories that form and inform individuals' imagination as simply. Collectively shared in a society, I think social imagination is quite an apt term here. Now, if we look back at Church's account, looking through how、um, imagination gets activated through memory, through、um, associations from the past, through cognitive penetration, through prediction, and so on, we can see how social imagination plays a huge role in a lot of these processes. So, how does social imagination affect the individual's imagination? Now, first, I want to briefly note that what we call my memory or my experience isn't really all that personal as it seems. What I go through at the time and what I remember at a later time is already mediated through socially learned ways of thinking and acting. Further, we should also consider those memories we have not just of our own experiences. But also of the representations of individuals and their experiences that we were exposed to in the past, and these representations may be in the form of images or narratives. I think we are pretty familiar with how images can impact what we imagine of other individuals. So I will say a little bit about narratives. Stories constitute a very important mode of operation of the social imagination. From legends, myths, fables to works of literature, to stories played out in the film, stories fill in for us what is missing from our own experiences. 
What we do not experience, we are taught to imagine as we enter into the imaginary worlds of the stories. When we encounter someone quite different, we fall back on these stories, just as we would with memories if we had any, to make sense of them. R.G. Thompson gives a vivid example of how stories impinge on one's perception of someone with an unusually sized body. So here she talks about, for example, how we perceive someone who is really large, unusually large, or someone maybe unusually small. And we automatically, and we can't help it, just import these stories, these images of giants, of dwarfs that we have come across in films or in other stories we have read. So Thompson continues, the sight of living people with unusual bodies invites us to remap fantastic stories of giants, dwarfs, and monsters onto those people. People who look like dwarfs, giants, and monsters draw stares because they are unfamiliar as flesh and too familiar as narrative. So it's interesting how Thompson points out these individuals come off as both unfamiliar and too familiar. Unfamiliar in the sense that we are really not imagining them correctly, the real individual. On the other hand, they are too familiar in the sense that we are really actively imagining, but we are imagining these wrong things, wrong images, wrong stories about them. As for associations, I find it odd that church doesn't really consider the kinds of associations that we absorb from society, such as stereotypes, metaphors, connotations, symbols, and so on. So here's a great example of metaphors associated with the term blindness. So disability activist Simi Linton talks about her experience of looking up the word blind. And what she found are terms like ignorant, imperceptive, insensitive, irrational, unaware, inattentive, purposeless. And she says, these meanings lurk under the surface when the word blind is used, whether on its own or in pairings. And I would say, these meanings also lurk under the surface when we see someone who is blind. Speaking of concepts, the phenomenon of cognitive penetration is no less vulnerable to the social imagination. So here is a great example from the article by Stephen Smith. Smith argues that disabled people face discrimination twice over, in the sense that first, um, they're discriminated against by social and political barriers um, in the structural environments that exclude individuals with certain medical conditions, but also they are also discriminated by social and political discourses that define what are, in the first place, talents and handicaps. So what he means is that our very conceptions of well-being, the good life, and so on, just exclude the presence of disability. And that explains why we find it very hard to imagine a disabled individual living a good life, flourishing, doing great. While person A's imagination of B may be quite expansive, though incorrect, as we have seen, it is nonetheless limited in significant ways. And it's not just that A gets it wrong. So it's not just a problem of the contents of A's imagination, which may be completely off. But I think the problem runs deeper. It seems like A has trouble going beyond his or her own imagination of B, or perhaps even unable to imagine B as he or she really is. Again, I think it would be misleading to construe this inability as a defect in the faculty of imagination itself, as rooted in person A, so to speak. But rather, I think it has a lot to do with the hold of social imagination. So I'm going to outline three ways in which A's ability to imagine is very much influenced or constrained, rather, by the power of social imagination. So first, I think social imagination severely constrains the flexibility of A's imagination. The pervasiveness of images, associations, narratives, and so on, as presented in the media, reinforced by others, immersed in the same social cultural context, such as parents, teachers, political leaders, means that it is experienced through one's lifetime. 
as part of the world one learns to accept as one's reality. It means that one becomes so habituated in it that it becomes natural to one to think that way. It becomes unconscious. But the hold of social、um, imagination derives its enduring strength not only from its embeddedness in our experience,、um, but also from the centrality of the concepts involved in cases of imaginative failures. Because at issue is not simply an encounter between two strangers, so we can think back to an encounter between an able-bodied person and a disabled person. Now, in that kind of encounter, I think it's also an occasion that calls into question one's understanding of a good life, what is normal, what makes us human, what makes life complete, and so on. And all of these are deeply woven into A's fundamental values. Understandings into her identity, and so they're really particularly resistant to change. Another source of inflexibility is the affective nature of imagination. Now, what we imagine is very different, or in, at least in this sense, quite different from what we believe, because the object of our imagination is bound up with feelings. Paul Ricoeur speaks of imagination as. Quote, reanimating early experiences, awakening dormant memories, spreading to adjacent sensorial fields. End of quote. And that is to say, imagination、um, is very much affect laden, and when feelings and emotions are involved, they are particularly hard to change, resistant, especially to reasoning. Second. Because the imaginative content is ready-made and readily available, it fosters passivity in A's use of imagination with regards to B. That is, when A encounters B, even though B's difference confounds A, A conveniently falls back on the ready-made version of B afforded by social imagination, instead of actively making an effort to learn about B by him or herself. No doubt, A's imagination is at work, but only passively, rehearsing what is already familiar to A, rather than venturing out to discover something new. Granted that A may well be curious about B, persons with disabilities report that they are often asked to explain the why. Why did they get disabled, and how? How do they live with it? About themselves by able-bodied people, but even then, the questions are certainly structured by the social imagination, and worse, the answers are often interpreted from within its prescribed perspective. Third, one might be quite complacent when their imagination is reinforced or confirmed. So, for example, if A meets B, a blind person, and simply assumes B is helpless because of His or her blindness, and proceeds to help, and thereby preventing B from demonstrating his or her competence. Then, in effect, A's judgment that B is helpless is confirmed, even though it is false. Since we have limited control over both the ability to imagine and the contents of our imagination, the task of reforming our individual im- imagination. Cannot succeed without also reforming the social imagination, and that requires collective and not just individual responsibility. And in particular, I think agreeing with Gatens and Lloyd, I think that the voices, perspectives, experiences, images of underrepresented groups are especially important here. But that is not to deny the role of individual responsibility in reforming our own imagination. At the very least, I think the lesson here is we should be a little skeptical about the images, conceptions, associations, narratives, and so on that we easily fall back on when we perceive someone who is quite different from us. Or, as Paul Ricoeur puts it, ideally we should try to keep a critical distance from what we imagine.